Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 103 of the Stephen King podcast. This is your host, Lou Sitzma, and I'm here bringing you a special episode of the Stephen King podcast. For this time, I'm doing it solo, and I'm just going to talk about three recent adaptations of Stephen King works that you're going to find on streaming services or on Blu-ray. And this is what I call the Tricolor King episode because each of these installments has a predominant color that's mentioned whether through the title or the format that it's been carried on. So we've got gray, blue, and green. And those colors stand for gray is for gray matter. Blue is for the stand, Blu-ray. And green is for In the Tall Grass, which is dropping today on Netflix and will be available for everybody to stream. So I'm going to talk about these three things in that order. And for those of you who are listening to this and have not yet watched the In the Tall Grass episode or movie, I'm sorry, on Netflix, don't worry about it. I will leave that one to the end and I'll do the spoilers for that one in the back half of that uh, segment. So you can listen to the first two pieces if you like, and then come back to the In Tall Grass, Into the Tall Grass later on. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive right into it. So let's start with Grey Matter. And Grey Matter is a short story by Stephen King that was first published way back in October 1973 in an issue of Cavalier magazine. And then later on, it was collected in Stephen King's short story collection, Night Shift. And it was uh, adapted by Greg Nicotero for Shudder. And Shudder is a streaming service which specializes or focuses on horror movies. And they've resurrected The Creep Show. It was based on uh, the magazine or Creep Show magazine. If you've seen the Creep Show movies, was that uh, Stephen King was in one of them famously, and so was Joe Hill for that matter. So what we have now is they've resurrected that series, and what they're going to have is ten episodes, and each episode is going to have two installments, roughly twenty minutes in length each. And that's an interesting approach because for a horror short story, that is twenty to thirty minutes. I think is a is a really good length for horror horror movies or horror episodes based on short stories, especially in this case, Stephen King's Grey Matter, which clocks in at a paltry twelve pages, which is pretty slim for a Stephen King story. And I have to say. My experience with this episode was interesting because the the production values of the opening credits really threw me for a loop. So the first time I watched this, I really did not enjoy my viewing experience at all. And it was because of the puppet mask that they were using for the creep show mascot. And it just looked really bad. It looked worse than the one that they used in the movie. So that just left a sour taste in my mouth that I wasn't able to get past as the episode played out. And so I wasn't really... I wasn't really digging the episode, and so I decided to rewatch it, and then before I, I did my review, I decided to go back to the source material and actually read the short story, and I realized as I was reading it that this, to me, is King's homage to B-horror type movies so, or, or storytelling, so it didn't really, it's not a story that ranks high in my pantheon of Stephen King material, and I noticed on Goodreads it's got a, a rating of 3.2 out of 5, which I I would put it around that mark. I'd maybe give it a 3.5. So it's definitely a lesser work to me. And it's interesting because reading the short story, the fun parts are actually more about the guys in the store shooting the shit, basically, <laughs> and telling stories to each other than the actual main part of the story, which is this, I guess what you could call it, is the ultimate skunky beer experience. And uh, we have a, a character that is in the short story and the episode is suffering the loss of his wife and never really recovers from that. And that's uh, Richie Grenadine, who is drinking a or a local beer brand that apparently seems to be carrying some sort of mutagen, I guess you could say, because once he starts drinking it, he starts to mutate into this slime uh, amoeba creature. And it's definitely grade B science storytelling here. And in the short story, the atmosphere is really made through the, uh, again, as always with King, it's with the characters and this 
collection of characters that are men that are that get together to, to shoot the shit with one another. They're basically in a, a dying town and in Bangor, and they're much like the opening scene of The Stand. They're just keeping each other company because they don't really have anything better to do. And so this this episode does a fairly close adaptation of the short story, though it does it uh, compresses it in some instances. There's less characters. There's only three three in the store and three three big name actors: Tobin Bell. Gina Carlino Esposito, who you know has the chicken man from Breaking Bad, and Adrian Barbeau, who was in The Crate in one of the uh, the original Creep Show movie. And I have to say, Adrian Barbeau, her hair has remained unchanged. It's uh, <laughs> it looks as thick and luxurious as I remember her from Maud as as it does in this episode of Creep Show. So. I don't know if there's some if she's doing some voodoo with her hair to keep it keep it like that, but it's funny. She she looks older, but her hair looks pr- pretty well the same. I I don't even know if, if it's her own hair anymore. Uh, maybe it's a wig. I don't know, but she still got the luxurious head of hair, which really stands out in the episode to me, <laughs> among us other things. So the the aesthetics of the show then are interesting in that I like the framing elements with the, you know, using the Creepshow magazine, showing pages from the magazine. And in the episode, they actually go to like the comic book panel type motif for certain transitional scenes. So I really like all of that. And I thought the opening credit sequences, the, the titles sequence with the CGI of, of the Creeper were really well done. But boy, that once that the actor who's in a, playing the Creeper with that mask, that mask just looks so phony that it, it just really really took me out of the episode and i i would rate this probably like a three three and a half out of five the biggest problem uh, on you know when i watched it the first time i was disappointed and i I chalked up a lot of that to that creeper mask but there's there's a a false beat in this episode that just really cut undercuts the episode for me and it's the with the father telling his son that he's going to quit drinking that he's going to quit he opens the beer i'm going to quit and after the third or fourth time you find in the sun the way the episode plays the sun comes to that realization well as well that his father is never going to quit but that's not that doesn't carry on through the episode because when they get to the climax of the episode and Adrian Barbeau's character is yelling at this boy as to why why he let this go on so long he, he, it's, and then the boy replies because he my, he's my daddy he told me he was he was going to quit which did not the earlier part of the episode did not convince us of that. It, in fact, it, it left me with the impression that the son knew that his father was never going to quit. So that false moment really, to me, is what undercuts this episode. And the the creature effects on the Richie Grenadine character once he transforms were they were okay. Uh, when it actually splits in two, yeah, you know, it's it was okay. <laughs> I guess I guess it was very it was very B horror stuff. So and you know when you have quality actors like Esposito and Barbeau and uh, Tobin Bell too, you know he's he's really made his name with the with the Saw series. But th- those you know that you have some really good actors there, and they didn't really stand out in the episode, which is to me is always a bad thing when you're doing Stephen King because it's always the characters that you come back to and they didn't really they didn't really establish those characters or or in 20 minutes it's i realize it's difficult to do too but it 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 was they just didn't resonate with me they just seem more like the actors than the than the characters that they were supposed to be playing this is one of those another one of those stories where it's really important to cast a kid character that can carry the the, the emotional heart of the story and I, I don't know who this actor is for, for this particular one but he he wasn't able to do that and i i don't totally blame him as i said i thought the writing set up a false a false climax fell so flat i just didn't believe it for a second so that was the that was my feelings on the the gray matter i i've seen other reviews uh, it's, they seem to be mixed though a lot of them are, are positive but if you're really into the b horror stuff then you you might enjoy this episode a lot more than i did but i was disappointed with it to, to be honest and uh, the second installment was actually based on a uh, josh mellerman story who you might know better through the bird box which i believe was aired on netflix as well and his story was much better done and the child actor in that that episode she had to carry that episode and she did a great job the only problem I felt with that with that episode is that there was no ending to it it just basically stopped and we never got any resolution to what was going on in that uh, particular story it'll be interesting to see how the rest of this creep show carries on but i was uh, unfortunately the gray matter one really just kind of left me a little bit feeling gray i really didn't like it on my first viewing but on my second viewing 
I enjoyed it a bit more than I did the first time. So maybe that's an avenue to explore, but I don't really have the desire to see it again. But the good thing is these episodes or these installments each are only like 20 minutes long, so it's not a big time commitment. Um, but it's worth checking out. And well, hopefully the other episodes will uh, feature uh, more interesting stories than the ones that we got for the opening installment. Yeah, that's how I feel about Grey Matter. I'm curious of, uh, as to uh, what everybody else out there thought. And it's it's a creep show. It's supposed to be a bit uh, fun, but uh, this one really didn't have any humorous uh, elements to it, unless you get a chuckle out of having the ultimate skunky beer experience, which I think we've all, if anybody's been a beer drinker, you've probably run into that scenario once or twice in your life and you know all about uh, what a skunky beer tastes like. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on from gray matter. This is great. What's our job? We'd like to drive around, pick up stiffs or what? It's time for reviews from the night shift. And now we're going to move over to the color blue. And for this particular one, we're looking at the Stand miniseries, which, as you all know, is a post-apocalyptic horror fantasy novel by, by Stephen King. And it expands on his earlier short story, Night Surf. And this one is Captain Trips, a engineered form of influenza that has been modified for biological warfare and basically wipes out 99% of the world's population. And it is the, this was published back in 1978, and it's the longest Stephen King novel that was ever published. And then it went on to become a big miniseries, 1990 miniseries on ABC TV and aired over four nights. And I've heard, I think depending on your age group, it's kind of like the same thing if you were younger when you saw Salem's Lot miniseries. That one still holds a special place in, in your heart and uh, in my heart for sure. Nothing else for the Danny Gleck scene at the window. But if you come to it with newer eyes, I've heard reviews from younger reviewers and whatnot that they don't really believe that the stand holds up. But I, I have to say, and you know, take, to, uh, trying to take into account my affection for the miniseries because I think it's the best adaptation of a King work that Mick Garris ever did. I really still like this one quite a bit. And Gary Sinise was a great Stu Redman. It's gonna it's gonna be interesting to compare the the new stand version that's coming out on CBS All Access next year against. The uh, actors that were in this one, I think there's a couple of areas of improvement that they could do on certain characters. And there's other ones that I thought were pretty well cast. Gary Sinise, I thought did a great job. Ray Walston, who my favorite Martian, I was always a big fan of him. I thought he was great as Glenn Bateman. Ruby D was pretty good as Mother Abigail. And overall, it was a pretty good adaptation of, of the a King work, especially for the, for the time, for the era that this was created in. And the special effects, obviously, are probably the weakest part of the episode. And for better or for worse, that Hand of God special effect is much like Kubrick's The Shining. Uh, here's Johnny. That hand has become iconic for the Stand miniseries and the Stand story, in a way, I think. And it's not a good... <laughs> it's not a... It's not a good memento that the the, the miniseries left behind because it, lo it looks uh, definitely looks cheesy and it's it's too bad because and it'll be interesting to see much like with it chapter two how they handled the spider which I thought technically it looked okay but I still don't think it was quite the approach that I would have gone for I still think uh I think they should have just embraced a spider really and gone gone for something like the Shelob spider from Lord of the Rings Return of the King like just make the scariest damn spider you can make and just don't fart around with all this pseudo pennywise multi-limbed entity as opposed to uh, uh you know straight on spider because a lot of people are scared of spiders i think more people are scared of spiders than they are of clowns so i i, I think you just have to sometimes embrace that and, and go with the thing that you can make of that particular version so but getting back to the stand so it's been released on blu-ray i've had it on dvd for ages and it was a, it's a flipper which means you have to play it on both sides if any of you have it you know what i'm talking about it was a, an okay transfer at the time i thought it was pretty good but that was an early release and now as time's passed and you've gotten better as dvd releases themselves just got better the quality of images improved and then of course when high def and blu-ray and now HD, UHD discs are out. Looking back at that transfer of the original of the original miniseries onto DVD, is it's it's pretty pretty murky. So though I didn't know it at the time, the colors are really washed out. And I have to say, with this Blu-ray, 
it's a quite an eye-opener, the amount of detail that they were able to pull from the 16 millimeter film that the this miniseries was filmed on. And and that's because 16 mil, the made the most resolution that you can get is 1920 by 1080. Usually when you're transferring something that's been f- uh, filmed, like if you look at the original Star Trek episodes, they were filmed on 35 millimeter and you can you can get 2K, 4K transfers from, from those uh, negatives still. So I'm happy to report that this transfer is is really, really good. I'd almost say fantastic, but given the limitations of the source material and compared it against other Blu-ray releases that we get nowadays, it's it's not up to that level. But boy, oh boy, you sure get a lot more detail in this one. And the color palette is much more vibrant as well. So I don't know if they boosted the colors or not, but I can't really complain because I think it looks pretty pretty natural and, and pretty, pretty pretty realistic. I mean, there's some of the dark scenes are still a little bit crushed, but or the detail's not as great as you would like. But boy, oh boy, if you see the scene in the Atlanta Disease Control Center with the hazmat suits, I'll, I'll put a link up uh, from a, a website that has some screen captures in that. They, they, they made this look almost like a, a different a movie. And I'm glad that they took the transfer from the original negatives as opposed to just up resing the, the DVD transfer which would have been terrible the only complaints i have about this transfer or this edition is that it's all done on one disc it would have been nice to have been on two discs i mean yes it's nice that you could put the disc in and you don't have to get up to to change it but for a, a mini series this long chances are you're not going to sit through the whole thing in one sitting anyhow so flipping disc was never an issue or transferring or changing discs so that that's a bit of a bummer i would have liked to have had a little more disk space headroom for the transfer to breathe and the other disappointing thing is the there's special features are just exactly the same ones that we got on the dvd there's the audio commentary and uh, a small short the making of Stephen King's a stand which is like think like a six minute electronic press kit basically so yeah there's from that perspective that that's a disappointment i'm i'm fearful that there's going to be another release of this a super duper release when the <laughs> when the new edition of the stand the airs next year but for now i think this is a worthy purchase i definitely really do love the the transfer on this i think it just looks great uh, another re- uh, another big bonus that I haven't mentioned yet is this cut is what's known as the Artisan Cut because it was uh, released by uh, Artisan as well and the original DVD. And that version has a couple of additional scenes that were cut for the when it was aired on ABC. And the two main scenes that are added are the uh, Dana death scene in Las Vegas when she kills herself on the glass. They cut away from uh, the actual showing her her being cut by the glass. And in this edition, they, they include that scene and they show Flag losing, losing it and throwing her body all over the place. And that's not in the version that was aired on TV or the, I don't believe on the original DVD release as well. And the other scene that's extended is the Flag Nadine se- sequence in the desert. That scene goes on a little bit longer and there's basically like a morning after scene that uh, sequence that we that was cut from the uh, uh, DVD cut as well and also and generally they they shorten the fade ins and fade outs on that art- artisan edit as well so this is that this is the same edit and it has those additional scenes and it would also it trims a couple of scenes but they're mostly like transitional scenes like of people walking or driving or whatever which don't add anything to the story but this one this one shortens that down because it wasn't necessary for this for this version because it wasn't airing commercials uh, obviously so uh yeah i i really really like this this transfer quite a bit and i've always been a big fan of the Ry cooter soundtrack on this the, the the guitar instrumental stuff that they play during the episode is really good so there's also some minor effects enhancements in certain scenes where buildings are burning and whatnot they've enhanced the flames and that but these are very minor additions much mi- more mild than say what they did with the original star trek series when they redid those effects uh, for the, the, the new versions of the episodes yeah what, what can i say i I really was surprised, pleasantly, happily surprised at how well this transfer came out. And if you're a big, if you're a Stephen King fan, or if you're a big fan of The Stand, and particularly the McGarris adaptation of it, it's uh, definitely one worth adding to your collection. So yeah, seriously, check that one out. (laughs) And now our final installment, The Color Green. And boy, there's a Kansas 
field full of green in this movie, this adaptation of a Stephen King, Joe Hill novella written together and released in two issues of Esquire magazine in the July and August 2012 issues. And this was their second collaboration. The first one was Throttle. And for the first time, In the Tall Grass is now available in book form in Joe Hill's just released short story collection, Full Throttle. So you can check out the story there if you haven't had a chance to read it yet. Uh, but for this adaptation for done by for Netflix, it's airing today on Friday, October 4th. And you will be able to stream it and watch it and, and enjoy it. And I can say right off the top, it is definitely worth a watch. I will do the first part of this rev uh, review of In the Tall Grass will be spoiler free. And then I'll do the spoiler section at, at the end so that uh, for you, those of you who haven't had a chance to see it yet, you can skip this that segment of, of this podcast. Alrighty. So let's dive into this a little bit. This was directed and uh, written by Vincenzo N Natalie, who has a fair amount of credits starting. Uh, he did a lot of work as a, in an art department, Ginger Snaps, which is a Canadian werewolf movie, I believe. And he was a storyboard artist on that one. So that's interesting. Uh, as a director, he's got 28 credits. And interestingly enough, two of those we haven't seen yet, and those will be episodes 9 and 10 of Lock and Key, the upcoming uh, adaptation of the Joe Hill comic book series. So that will be interesting to see. He's also done some stuff for Tremors, the TV movie, uh, Westworld, Lost in Space, Base, the Netflix TV series, I believe, American Gods. He did one episode, did a couple episodes for The Strain, did a uh, half a dozen of episodes for Hannibal, which was an excellent television series and well worth checking out. So he's got a fair bit of cred and experience with horror material. And I could say that that shows in this adaptation of In the Tall Grass, which in a lot of ways, the, the beginning of it reminds you, if you've ever seen that movie Jeepers Creepers, it starts with a brother and sister driving through the country. But in this case, the brother and sister are, the brothers come to pick up the sister to bring her back home because she's gotten pregnant. And the actors that play that, I'm not familiar with them. The Cal is the boy. It was play, played by Avery Witted. And the girl is Becky, Becky DeMonth, played by Liza D. Oliveria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Probably not. The big name in this attached to this is Patrick Wilson. And we'll get to him in a little bit. And the other main player, and this is a, a, a child actor, is uh, Will B Will Bui Jr. Butchering that last name. I don't know how you would pronounce it. It's B-U-I-E. We? Why? <laughs> I don't know, but that's that's interesting. And they have him listed as Tobin Humboldt, but that does... Uh, oh, that, that's right, because it's uh, Patrick Wilson's his father in this episode uh, movie. So generally, the acting is strong. I mean, it's, it's not a big cast, but I think Patrick Wilson has a lot of fun in this one. And I have to say that I, I always hark, hark on child actors, but this, this actor that got, this uh, Will Jr. actor that they got, he's got a great face for horror. Not that he's, uh, you know, not that he's horrific looking or anything like that, but he's got one of those child faces that he looks young, but at the same time, he looks like an old man. Uh, when you see the when you see the movie, I don't know if you'll you'll get the same vibe from that, but I, I think you'll see what I mean. He's got a young old face, which is an interesting look and works really really well in this episode. Um, uh, I keep saying episode this movie because uh, because of the setting with the, all the confined spaces with the grass and whatnot, and uh, he just looks really he looks unsettling, creepy. Yet at the same time, you still felt sorry for him that all the stuff that was going on with his family, with his father and mother, who was played again by Patrick Wilson, and the mother was Rachel Wilson, but she wasn't in the episode in the movie as long uh, as much, so her part wasn't that that big. But there's some definitely some great scenes between Patrick Wilson and and this child actor that played out really well. But of course, the big the big thing about this movie or this concept is the tall grass and. It was used masterfully. The director in this in this adaptation, I thought that he really gave it a sense of presence as a, a living entity. There were some great little bits where one of the characters, and I'll, I'll get into that in the spoilers a bit more, but he tries to, using a breadcrumbs or a string on a spool, that he tries to, to mark his trail by tying knots in the grasp. And I thought that was one of the more quiet and uh, creepy moments. But th there's there's another great shot that I will talk about in the spoiler section as well that I, that, that I want to mention. But I, I just want to say overall, you really do believe that the grass is a living entity and that it's using its collective 
all the collective strands of it to <laughs> uh, to keep these people uh, separated and, and preventing them from finding their way back out into the road and that. So I, I thought that the director made a really great use of that. And of course, with the CGI and that, you can make it do things that you uh, couldn't do practically. So that, that was quite beneficial, I'm sure, for him in creating a lot of the creepier moments. There's a lot of great overhead shots. There's a lot of between the row shots. Like he almost, it really feels more like a cornfield than a grass field because the grass is so tall, but that was really well done. What else can I say? It, if you're a real big fan of the short story, you know that when you're doing adaptations, there's going to be changes in that are just necess- necessary because you're, you're moving from one medium to another. And I'll expand upon that in the spoiler section again, but that's something that you sh- you're going to probably have to reconcile as, as you w- see the movie unfold. So it's a, it's a big game of cat and mouse with characters getting separated and then being brought back together again. And if the if there's downsides to this movie, it's that the two leads, the brother and sister, don't have really much of a sense of presence to me. Though between there were moments where the the relationship between the brother and sister, you got kind of like a little bit of a creepy vibe that the brother Cal was maybe just a little bit too much into his sister. <laughs> so that so that that there was that kind of a little bit of tension there. But other than that, the two actors were pretty earnest the whole time. So there wasn't much modulation in their characters i guess you could say they were they were pretty well one note all the time so that that was a drag that that the movie was starting to drag because of that but then fortunately patrick wilson comes on the scene and he literally is chewing at the scenery by the time his character by the time to get to know his character a little bit more and he was i think he must have been having a blast playing this character because he's he's definitely brings a mom, some levity to what's been a uh, a pretty earnest story up until this point and so on the one hand it's a little bit feels a little bit cheesy but on the other hand you're going like okay now we finally we're getting some color we're getting some energy in in the, in the movie which he just came at the right time because i felt the movie was starting to sag a little bit because it was on such a a one note beat for that first opening segments and that. So I really, I really did enjoy this quite a bit. I'd probably rate this like, I'd probably give around an eight out of 10. I, I thought it was pretty well done. Technically, as I said, I thought the special effects in that were quite well done as well. There's so there's no eye rolling moments or anything like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a neat, tense little movie and doesn't overstay its welcome. It's, let me see, how long is it here? It is. It's uh, 91 minutes, which is just the perfect length for a horror movie, I believe. There can be longer movies, but those ones usually involve either a larger cast or it's more of a psychological horror, so you have to build up the tension. I mean, this one, you're into the grass fairly quickly. So, and it's it's a simple concept, really. And so there's not a lot, there's not a, a big mythology or anything to build up here. So it's just, it's one of those, some of the best horror movies are the, are the simplest things. What if it never stops raining? Or what if it never, what if the sun never comes up again? Like I'm thinking of Isaac Asimov's Nightfall, which is a science fiction story, but it's a very you know these these simple concept stories that King does all, all the time, trapped in a trapped in a car with a, a rabid dog out on a raft, and you're stranded because there's a blob that'll eat you if you if you try to get back on the water. So those simple idea simple idea stories work really quite well. And this is this is a, a simple concept story as well. You, know, you just have to buy into this conceit that the grass is intelligent and alive and is evil and and it's it's has malicious intentions for you so it's a definitely a fun little movie and i i i I really quite enjoyed it quite a bit so that is as much as i've got for the non-spoiler section of the episode so for you, those of you who have not yet seen In the Tall Grass on Netflix, I'm going to go into spoilers now. So I'm going to give you three, two, one count, and then I'm going to go into some spoilers. All righty. And check out our next uh, Stephen King podcast, and that will be returning guest Bryant Burnett. And we'll be giving our review of Stephen King's latest novel, The Institute. Until then, take care. So long. Bye bye. Three, two, one. All right. So. If you're a purist and you'd hate it when they don't stick to the source material, you might be a little upset with this one because the ending in that one, the ending in the short story is a downer, as you know, because the brother and sister and the boy, they all become enslaved by the stone that's at the center of the, well, I assume it's at the center, but it's deep within this grass field. And I have to say that the special effects and the actual design of the stone and that, that stuff was really cool and really well done. And 
just they didn't overplay they didn't go heavy into any sort of like pyrotechnical special effects with that it was just the the rock was pretty true to what was in the short story as as was the carvings but the becky character does not have the baby in the grass or or she never does she never touches the rock but patrick wilson does and He's already touched it when he first pops into the movie. So he's already been enslaved and tranced, and he's just Coco with Coco Puffs out in that grass field. So he's <laughs> he's working towards trying to get everyone to touch the stone. So it's always funny how he's trying to portray this, the adult of the story, I guess, you can, and, and the leader and that. But he's, he's so over the top in that. And there's obviously something he's not playing with a full deck and the other characters uh, pick up on that fairly quickly. So it's, it's quite humorous. And he gets to do some violent things and he has some violent things done to him. So he must have... He probably had a blast uh, with this, and his his wife in this, the Rachel Wilson, was I believe that's his real his wife in real life. Da, 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 does it say here? It doesn't. But she's a sister of Callie Wilson. But I just figured maybe he was she was married to to him. But it doesn't. Uh, it's maybe she is, but it doesn't say say here. But uh, anyhow, uh, it's just odd that they have the same <laughs> same last name in real life. But uh, she doesn't have a big part in this, so she's not a major player. And the the other aspect of this adaptation that's different than the source material is it's much more of a timey-wimey construct in the, that characters are coming in and out of the story at different points in time. So that when they meet cross paths at certain points, one character will know the other one and the other character has never met the other one. So they're always you know, a little bit confused as to uh, how somebody either does or doesn't know who they are so that that was interesting and one of the most effective shots that in the movie in the movie was the brother and sister when they got separated they decided to jump up in the air with their arms extended to see if they could see each other and the in the first shot they do that and they're maybe like 50 yards apart and then they jump the second time and then they're like 250 yards apart but the, no time has passed between those two you know except for the jumps so that simple little one two shot of that really sets the time tone for the whole episode and father of Becky's child he he comes into the episode and that's Travis Travis McKean and that he's played by an Australian act, actor Harrison Gilbertson and that added a whole interesting element to the to the movie and and a bit of a it started a triangle between him and the brother and Becky and so that was kind of that was interesting as well and he ends up making the the big sacrifice that allows Becky and Cal and Tobin, the boy, to escape. And it's interesting because Becky and Cal are coming into that final scene from the same scene that they started at the movie, yet Tobin's coming out of the field having lived through everything that we've just seen. So he's all dirty and all this and looking like a... <laughs> Like he's, he's been lost in the jungle, basically. And then the problem with timey-wimey stuff is you uh, start asking questions about, well, if this happened, then how could this possibly happen? And how, how come he, this they don't remember this, but he does remember this, and but this person died? And so all this, kind of, all this kind of stuff is left hanging at the end of the movie, and that's one of the weaker, that's definitely one of the, the weaknesses of it. But over the course of the movie, I, I enjoyed it that and that was not as evident in the short story i, I don't believe and uh, so there's a there's a definite an unexpected timey-wimey aspect to this adaptation that caught me a little by surprise but it was a good game of cat and mouse throughout the the movie and i am on record as saying that i didn't enjoy this did not enjoy the second half of the short story as much as the first half and i have to say that this one the this movie plays pretty even all the way through i there was nothing outlandish that was added to the story that threw it for a loop, except for the time time travel or playing with the timeline stuff. So it's it's a solid adaptation, definitely definitely a good addition to the the long long list of Stephen King and I, the way things are going. Joe Hill ad adaptations that are taking place. So I, I highly re recommend you check this one out, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. So so that's gonna do it. So there we have uh, my reviews on Gray Matter. The Stand on Blu-ray and In the Tall Grass on Netflix. So I, I hope you enjoy these reviews and special tip of the hat to Netflix for giving me early access to, to screen this so that I could have it, the review ready to go for you guys on the drop date for the In the Tall Grass. And I hope you enjoy this. And thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.